He's a really, um, really interesting. Uh, he's an economist and uh, some sort of philosopher, I guess. But um, you know, people think that gold is the resource, or that, uh, or that oil is the resource, or that electricity is the resource, or you know, pineapples are the resource, or whatever it may be. And you know, resources are only resources because people figure out how to apply them. Okay, and so there's there's been a long, long history of shortages. The world is running out of whatever, okay? And 150 years ago, everybody was in a crazy panic because they were afraid that the world was running out of whale oil. And as soon as the whale oil is all gone, all the industrial machines and everything are going to just shut down and we're going to go into a new dark ages or something. Well, you know what? And they discovered other kinds of oil, and there's coal, and what, and, and see, so what makes a resource a resource is, is that ingenuity uh, figures out how to apply something that was previously thought to be useless, okay? So I think people understand this much better now than they ever used to. Intel makes pentium chips out of sand. Sand. Okay. Uh, sand is about as worthless as anything you can imagine, and a penny chip is worth more than its weight in gold. It's all ingenuity. Uh, software companies, internet companies, make they create value, they create fast fortunes out of ones and zeros. Okay? Uh, this, is, this is really profound, because what it means is that you're only one idea, one inspiration away from a complete change uh, of everything, from a, a new regime, okay? Um, you know, we, we were talking last night, um, and really for the last two days, about, you know, Google is like, you know, the new 800-pound gorilla in the world, right? And wow, they're, you know, they're so powerful and everything like that. You know, in the next 10 years, somebody will come up with something that is brand new, that the world has neither heard of nor thought of, that will be bigger than Google 20 years from now. And Google will be like, oh yeah, it'll, it'll be like Microsoft. Oh yeah, Steve Ballmer is going to go on his big rants, you know. And, yeah, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna beat a bunch more profit out of the market this quarter. But you know what? They're, they're old news, right? So, and such is the world. Okay. Well, um, the, the ancient, ancient people um, used to, uh, they used to describe genius not so much as something that people possessed but more like something that showed up sometimes if you were paying attention and ready to listen to it. Um, Brian told me a story, I haven't heard the original story myself, but as I understand, the entire idea and plot of, of Harry Potter came to J.K. Rowling like in 30 seconds. You know, and runaway bestseller, you know, smashes records and, and, and everything like that. Uh, and I really do believe um, that sometimes those brilliant ideas, they come from the outside, okay? Yeah. And um, as far as I'm concerned, um, alchemy, if you want to know where it comes from, it comes from wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom is the ability to prioritize understand and organize information. Knowledge, okay? Wisdom is, is knowledge as seen from the highest possible level, okay? So, you know, we talk about tactics, we talk about strategies, okay? Well, you know, and strategies are higher in the world than tactics. Well, you know, wis wisdom is on top. And uh, today I'm gonna read 
from you a few stories from the most banned book in the history of the world, um, the Old Testament. Um, I'm in 1 Kings chapter 3, and I, th I think this is a very, very interesting story. Um, this is in regards to Solomon, who is the son of David. And it says, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream, and God said, what do you want? Ask, and I will give it to you. That's pretty interesting. Now, um, I think most people, when presented with an opportunity like that, would, would, would think, wow, I have just been given an opportunity. Um, a person with discernment would, would hear that and say, wow, I've just been given a test. Okay, and you know what? Every opportunity is really a test. Okay, it's, 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 only, it's only the, the, uh, the prologue to yet a greater thing that comes next. So here's what Solomon says. He goes... He goes, you have made me king instead of my father David, but I am like a little child who doesn't know his way around. And here I am in the midst of your own chosen people, a nation so great and numerous they cannot be counted. Give me an understanding heart so that I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong. For who by himself is able to govern this great people of yours? Okay, now, he could have, basically two ways he could have responded to this. He could have responded out of pride or out of humility. If he had, if he had responded to this out of pride, he would have said, Wow, this is my lucky day. Okay, and he would have, he would have done something narcissistic. Okay? But instead, he took it as a test, and he took it with humility. He's like, hmm, I have just been made king, and God's going to give me everything I need. What if I decide not to think about myself first? Okay? And then here's the answer. The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for wisdom. So God replied, because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice, and have not asked for a long life, or wealth, or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart such as no one else has had or ever will have. And I will also give you, this is interesting, I will also give you what you did not ask for, riches and fame. No other king in all the world will be compared to you for the rest of your life. And if you follow me and obey my decrees and my commands as your father David did, I will give you a long life. Okay? Very interesting. And then, and then it goes on to tell this, this, this interesting story, which I'll just briefly read. Um, sometime later, two prostitutes came to the king to have an argument settled. Please, my lord, one of them began this woman and I live in the same house. I gave birth to a baby while she was with me in the house. Three days later, she also had a baby. We were alone, and we were the only two in the house. But her baby died during the night when she rolled over on it. Then she got up in the night and took my son from beside me while I was asleep. She laid her dead child in my arms and took mine to sleep beside her. And in the morning, when I tried to nurse my son, he was dead. But I looked more closely in the morning light and saw it wasn't my son at all. Then the other woman interrupted, it is certainly your son, and the living child is mine. No, Jerry Springer, right? <laughs> then the king said, let us get the facts straight. Both of you claim the living child is yours. Each said the dead ones belong to the other. All right, bring me a sword. The sword was brought to the king. He said, cut the living child in two, give half to one woman, and half to the other. Then the woman who was the real mother of the living child, and who loved him very much, cried out, No, no, no. Give her the child. Please do not kill him. The other woman said, All right, he will be neither yours nor mine, divided between us. Then the king said, Do not kill the child, but give him to the woman who wants him to live, for she is his mother. When all Israel 
heard the king's decision, the people were in awe of the king, for they saw the wisdom of God had given him for rendering justice. Now, um, there, there's a verse in the New Testament in the book of James that says, If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Now that, that, is a, that is a very strong statement, and it is followed by the statement, But let he who asks, ask without doubting, because he who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind, and unstable in all his ways. Now, if you want to see this play out in the world, all you, every, every single day all you have to do is look at the bizot market. Okay? What should I do? What should I do? I'll buy an ebook, and then I you know, go on this little tangent, and then I'll buy another one, and they go this way. Well, I'm not really sure if this, oh, I think I'm going to do this, and oh, I think I'm going to do this. And where does that get them? Absolutely nowhere. Okay? Absolutely nowhere. And what it eventually leads to is extremely cynical people who are mad at the world and, you know, they think everybody who was successful just got lucky and all that kind of stuff, okay? Um, I believe that if you ask for wisdom, you will be given wisdom, okay? And it's the most valuable thing you could ever want, okay? Um, and... Uh, and I think, I think pe people who value wisdom, um, they, uh, they are more principle-centered. Um, they, they trust their inner voice more. Um, they are less uh, pushed around by fads and trends and you know, things that come today and are gone tomorrow. And they're not driven and tossed by the wind. Okay? There's a stability, there's a consistency, and there's a calmness that is uh, extremely refreshing. You know, that, that driven and tossed by the wind thing, it's, at first it seems kind of entertaining and interesting, but after a while, you just get tired of the constant drama and churn. It just gets tiring. Like, I'm tired of, I'm tired of you know, not having time to do things right the first time, and then somehow having time to fix it and do it all over the second time, right? And so Solomon actually um, became extremely, extremely prosperous. Um, I'll just... Uh, um, the, he, the, the, uh, the, the amount of money that, that other kingdoms were, were paying him, uh, let's see... Um, he had 25 tons of gold every year being shipped to him from other kings. Uh, the, queen of, the queen of Sheba, which is Ethiopia, she came, uh, traveled many, 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 many miles, and was like, wow, everything I've heard about this place is true. And he answered every single question that she had to her satisfaction, and his fame spread far and wide, and it, it was... It, it, it was an extremely prosperous time in the history of Israel. Now, then the story takes an interesting turn, which I think is, again, also uh, very interesting and very telling. Um, now, King Solomon loved many foreign women. Besides, besides Pharaoh's daughter, he married women from Moab, Am Ammon, Edom, Sidon, and from among the Hittites. Uh, the Lord had clearly instructed the people of Israel, you must not marry them because they will turn your hearts to their gods. Yet Solomon insisted on loving them anyway. He had 700 wives of royal birth. Okay? You know, in the ancient world, you do like peace treaties by, you know, okay, I'll marry your daughter, and that way you won't come kill me, and I won't come kill you, and all that kind of stuff. 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. Okay? Now, a thousand wives? Holy cow. You know? I kind of have a hard time keeping one happy. <laughs> right? Um, is, is there a sense that maybe this guy had some excesses in his life? 
okay? Um, and and he, he, wasn't, he wasn't willing to curb his excesses, okay? And, um, you know, let, let's, just, let's just sort of generalize that to, let's just call it addictions, you know? Solomon had an addiction. You know, he always had to have a woman ready to go, okay? And um, it, it, it became his downfall, okay? Now, uh, one thing that I know about pretty much all entrepreneurs is we're all addictive and obsessive, okay? And life uh, very often is a, is a uh, struggle to take our addictive energies and channel them into something useless and something that's not destructive, okay? And, um, you know, and I, 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 I have no doubt that there's, there's all kinds of people, you know, within the sound of my voice who, who've struggled with all kinds of things. And, 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 and I don't bring this up uh, from any standpoint of neg negative judgment at all, but actually just to say that if you want to manage your creative energy and manage that, you also need wisdom for that too. Okay, and, and when you get wisdom, you need to listen to it and obey it. Okay, and Solomon did. I mean, he was clearly told, don't marry these people. And, and by the way, uh, I'll add something else here because it's kind of important. Okay, it says, in Solomon's old age, they turned his heart to worship other gods instead of being completely faithful to the Lord his God as his father David had done. And the, it's real important what the text says here. It says, Solomon worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. In this way, Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He refused to follow the Lord completely, as his father David has done. Now, when it says Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites, the word immolation... Who knows what the word immolation means? Setting fire to something. Setting fire to something. It, it means setting fire to people. Um, people who worship Molech would burn their children alive as a sacrifice to appease the gods. Okay, and the wisest man in the world is worshiping, is, is involved in that kind of worship um, because he refuses to curb his appetites. Okay? Like he's been told. If, if you go, if you go too far, if you start marrying these other people, they will suck you into their belief system. And your wisdom did not come from there. Your wisdom came from God. Um, and and, uh, and, and, and it's, it's actually very sad what, what happens next. It says, it says, he had warned Solomon specifically about worshiping other gods, but Solomon did not listen to the Lord's command. So now the Lord said to him, Since you have not kept my covenant and have disobeyed my decrees, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your servants. Okay? Now, it's actually it's very sad what happened because, because David's kingdom was incredible. And Solomon's was even better, and Israel never regained that glory. In 3,000 years, Israel has never been what it was in Solomon's time. It fell apart. You read the whole rest of the Old Testament, and it's one calamity after another, after another, after another, after another. Okay? He was told what to do. He was given the wisest mind in the history of mankind, and he made poor choices. Okay? And I, I think that as you, as you climb the ladder of success, you walk a higher and higher tightrope. And what you do affects more and more people. And one, one of the things that happens as you, you know, you grow your company and at first it's just you. And then it's like you and one other person. And then it's you and a collection of people, and then maybe it's 50 people, and maybe it's 100 people, and your influence grows, okay? And eventually, you, you may be influencing thousands of people in ways that you don't even realize, okay? And you know, that, that comes with a great sense of responsibility, 
Okay. Um, you know, I have this very strong sense that every time I send out an email, every time I send out a blog post, you know, people are being affected. People are on the edge. Um, uh, a lot of you probably saw my rant about public education the other day. I love rants, you know? I love stirring up all that energy. Well, you know, a guy gets on the blog and he says, you know what, I just pulled my son out of school yesterday. Put him in when he was five, he always hated school, he's 10 years old, pulled him out, yesterday was the happiest day of his life. It's like, oh yeah, what I do actually affects what people do, not just, you know, what they said, you know? Wow, okay, well, duh, I already knew that. Um, <laughs> but but it, it, still, it still caught me by surprise, it shouldn't have, but it still did, okay? And, um, you know, uh, most, most of you heard, have heard my like Amway pink Kool-Aid stories and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, you know, I just, I just totally took it hook, line, and sinker. And uh, for about six years, I was just, you know, relentlessly, okay, let's try it this way. Let's try it. It's like the Swiss Army knife um, that didn't ever work. You know, every possible blade I could think of. Um, and... I feel, in, uh, I have a different perspective on that now than I, than I had way back when. You know, way back when it was like, wow, what an incredible waste of several years of my life. Um, now, now, now that I'm in a world where most people make all their decisions like based on a split test, I'm like, well, let's say something and see if it tests better. Like, to where they kind of lose track of even, like, figuring out whether what they said was true or not. Okay? Um, I, I think the biggest thing that I took away from that whole experience was, don't you ever, 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 at least knowing, do not exploit people's desire to be free. Never do that. That, that, is a, that is a form of abuse that is very damaging, okay? Um, it, is, it is a responsibility if you teach anything. You have a responsibility that is to be stewarded. Um, let me, let me uh, tell you some other, uh, go, go to some other directions here. Um, you understand that, that the, the wealth of Solomon's kingdom was from his wisdom. And it was from the blessing of God. God said, I'm going to bless you. Okay? And I, I think, I believe I, and with all my heart that the blessing of God is a very real thing. I think there are times in your life where God says, I know you want, I know you want blessing right now, but right now um, you're, you're going you're gonna to walk through valley. And then there are other times when God says, you know what, it's time to turn on the blessing machine. And here it comes. How do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, it's like, what did I do to deserve this? What did I do to deserve such a great wife or such a great set of kids or such a great set of parents or such a great best friend who lives next door or or what did, what did I do to, I mean, this business just took off like crazy, you know? I'm harvesting from fields I did not plant. It's the blessing of God. Um, and, I, and I think it's, a, it's important to realize um, you didn't necessarily do this. You know, maybe, uh, maybe in some sense, J.K. Rowling only half wrote Harry Potter, like, maybe she didn't write all of it, okay? Now, and I'm not, I'm not trying to make a statement about Harry Potter really at all. That's really not the point. But, but you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, it's like you're, you're in the shower and this idea just comes to you, you know? That's where most of my emails and blog posts come from, frankly. It's like, well, time to go take a shower and see what comes out. <laughs> Um, okay, 
Um, so, 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 so the, 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 there's two kinds of alchemy, and the first kind is the creation of wealth from thin air, out of pure ingenuity. I really believe that, like all the world's problems and all the environment and and and, and starving people and corruption and all that. Okay, all those situations only need wisdom. And they'll get solved. And they need humility. Because, because you have to ask for wisdom. Okay? God said, what do you want? I, I really believe that everybody has moments in life where, like, what do you want? And you ask for it and you get it. And I hope what you asked for was what you really needed or what you really wanted. You might need to ask for wisdom just to know what to ask for. Well, uh, I don't know. What do you suggest I ask for? Okay? Um, so I want to talk about another kind of alchemy, though. And this is, this is really interesting. And, um, and so I take you to the story of Joseph. So, and I'm not going to... It's really interesting. Joseph occupies about one-fourth of the book of Genesis. Okay? I mean... For, for an ancient document that had to get copied on scrolls and all that kind of stuff, that's a lot of real estate for one story, okay? And it's actually a setup for an even bigger story, but, but basically here's what happens. Joseph, um, I'll, I'll just read you the first little wee bit of it, because I think it's hilarious. One night, jo so Joseph is the, kid, the favorite son of the father, and he's got a coat of many colors, and He's better dressed than all the other brothers, and they already hate him, okay? One night, Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Listen to this dream, he said. We're out in the field, tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly, my bundle stood up, and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. <laughs> He's, like, waiting for them to go, cool, Joseph, I get, you know. And they're like, oh, we've got to get rid of this guy. Like, literally get rid of this guy. Okay? Now, re now remember, the, these, these guys are Jews, right? And it specifically says that Arab traders can get them. You know how much Jews and Arabs just love each other, right? You know, it's well known. Okay? These Arabian traders came by, they sold Joseph to these guys, and they, they took him into slavery. They took him to Egypt and sold him as a slave. Okay? Now, that is a bad day. <laughs> wow. Now imagine, you know, he's like, well, I don't know if he's on the ox cart or if he's walking behind the donkey or cleaning up the camel dung or whatever job they gave him. You know, but imagine, you know, you're walking by a stinky camel, cleaning up the camel dung, and you're like, hmm, today, last night I had a dream about my brother's sheaves bowing to mine, and today I'm being sold into slavery. <laughs> Um, and uh, not a good day for Joseph. And, um, well, so as the story goes, he, he goes and he works for a guy named Potiphar. Potiphar likes Joseph a lot. Like, this is a good kid. He's a good protege. He does great work. I'm going to put him in charge of more and more stuff. It's, it specifically says... Joseph did such a good job running Potiphar's house, he had nothing to worry about except what he was going to eat for dinner. Everything else was taken care of. How many of you, like, you know, want a business manager like that, right? Okay? And then it says, you know, Joseph was a very handsome man, and Potiphar's wife was hot for Joseph. Okay? She likes this guy. And she's like, come sleep with me, come sleep with me, come on. You know? And uh, single guy, good looking, and he says, he says, I could never do to your husband, I could never do that to your husband, and I could never do that to God. But he, she keeps pursuing and pursuing, and finally one day, she grabs him by the coat, and he runs, and the coat is left in her hand, and uh, you know that, that phrase about, you know, hell has no scorn, like the scorn of a woman? Uh, she accuses him of trying to rape her. And he gets thrown in jail. That is another bad day. 
okay? And, he, and he's riding in jail, and he's like, okay, there were the sheaves, and then there was the Arabian traders, and then there was that, and then now this. But actually what it says over and over, but, but God was with him. But God was with him. But God was with him. And he's in jail, and he interprets the dreams of a couple of guys, and he interprets them correctly, and then one, and then Pharaoh has a dream, and one of those guys says, hey, I knew this guy named Joseph, um, who, uh, who interprets dreams, we could go get him out of prison, and like he was supposed to remember Joseph several years ago, he forgot all about, oh yeah, I told that guy I was going to get him out. Um, <laughs> And so, and, and, and again, you, you, you really got to stop and think, is, okay, it's 11.37 at night. Oh, it's 11.38 at night. I'm sitting in my cell. Uh, the crickets are chirping. The cockroaches are walking across my cell. The rats are eating my sandals. Okay? And I've been here four years. Right? Not not a fun situation but God was with him I mean so what's going on he's learning to hear God's voice he's learning to discern he's learning you know that impetuous hey hey brothers let me tell you about my dream okay you know he's kind of lost that it's like well, not so fast dude <laughs> right and and um so Pharaoh has this dream, and he's very disturbed by it. He doesn't know what it means, and it's about uh, it's about these cows and the skinny cows eat the fat cows. And, and Joseph comes and he says, "Okay, here's what your dream means. Your dream means there's going to be seven years of pros incredible prosperity, and there's going to be seven years of horrible famine. And you need to use the seven years of prosperity to store up food." Otherwise, everybody's going to starve to death. You need to appoint somebody who can be in charge of all this. And, and Pharaoh goes back and confers, and he goes, you know what? You're the guy. I'm going to make you the number two guy in Egypt, and you're going to be in charge of this. Okay? Now, talk about a riches to rags, to riches to rags, to riches story. And God was with him. Okay? Now, um, I think the most interesting part about this story comes when his brothers show up to get food. Now, how long has this been? I don't really know. Probably some Bible commentary would figure it out, but you know, maybe 40 years has gone by. Maybe more. I don't know. But, you know, Joseph is long gone, uh, as far as his brothers are concerned, everybody, everywhere is starving to death, they come to Egypt, and wouldn't you know, they're there to get food, and they're in front of Joseph, and they don't know it. And Joseph recognized every single one of them, and he runs them through this maze, which I won't go into, uh, I think God likes mazes. And, uh, and finally, finally, Joseph can't stand it anymore, and he sends everybody out, he closes up the room, and, and, and he, he takes off whatever his, you know, his hat is or whatever, and, and he says, I'm Joseph, I'm your brother. And the dream had come true. He says, please come closer, he said to them. So they came closer. He said to them, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. But don't be upset and don't be angry with yourselves. I need a pulpit. Um... Don't be upset. Don't be angry with yourselves for selling me into this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. This famine that has ravaged the land for two years will last five more years, 
and there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and preserve many survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. And he is the one who made me an, an advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of his entire palace and the governor of all Egypt. And in fact, the very last chapter of Genesis, um, more years have gone by, and the brothers are still afraid that Joseph is mad at him. They still have self-condemnation. I mean, okay, go back and, and, and think of it from their point of view. Gee, you know, selling Joseph into slavery seemed like kind of a good idea at the time. Wonder where he is. I wonder where he is. I wonder what's going on. You know, he wasn't that bad. He did give me some Pokemon cards when I was nine. Right? They've been beating themselves up for this for decades. But um, then his brothers came and threw themselves down before Joseph. And again, this is years after the first reunion. They threw themselves down before Joseph. Look, we are your slaves, they said. But Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? There's that humility again. You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. No, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. So he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. Okay? Now. Somehow, in the years of prison, Joseph made peace with the path that he'd been sent on in life. He made peace with the hard things that had been put in his life. Okay? Now, I don't care who you are. I don't care what's good in your life. There's some bad stuff in your life that you haven't been able to get rid of, no matter how hard you try. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to, I'm gonna go to um, 8.30. Okay. So... Um, you know, th there are these things in your life, okay? And, you know, it's that old phrase, you can light a candle or you can curse the darkness. And, and, and Joseph had the wisdom to understand that there was a purpose in what was going on and that there was a bigger plan than his own plan. And he forgave his brothers, okay? Now... I truly believe that forgiveness is a second form of alchemy. Okay? Um, and and I, I think I've come to understand this in ways, even in the last few months or a year or two, that, that I used to not really understand. Um, and a lot of this has come from, from really amazing friends that I have who've walked through really hard stuff. And I'll tell you about two of them. One, one guy's name is Matt. Um, Matt's wife left him, and uh, you know he had a son, and it was ugly, and there had been other breaches of trust, and like this was not the first time, and so you know all the feelings and struggles and battles that you go through, and wanting to kill somebody and everything like that, and Matt decided, I am going to figure out how to forgive her. I am going to figure out how to forgive this guy that she's with. I, I, I am going to I am going to let go of this. And actually, Matt went to the restaurant where his wife's boyfriend was working, and he said, "I'd like to talk to you." Like it was you know way before lunchtime, and nobody was really in the restaurant yet. And he goes in there, and he's like, "Can I talk to you?" Um, yeah, I guess so. And they sit down, and he had this conversation where he basically says, I forgive you for what you did to me. And I just, I want to bless you in whatever way I can, and I just needed to tell you that. And he left. I have another friend 
to um, actually the you know the the divorce examples and the Swiss Army knife thing are inspired by like all of the late night conversations we've had with her for the last three years because her husband left her. A month ago, she had coffee with her husband's fiance, now fiance, you know, was his mistress, and she said, and and so like she's she's you know there, there, there's kids and it's messy and there's and there's uh, um, whatever they call it when you go, the kids go back and forth between the parents and uh, and all that stuff. What custody, yeah, all the custody issues and everything like that. And she has coffee with this woman. She says, I forgive you for taking away my husband. And she, she was not being melodramatic. She was not being a drama queen. She was like, okay, this is something that I am going to let go of. Okay? Now, here's what I've seen with both of these people. Is that as they have walked this through, the amount of power that they have, the amount of spiritual power they have, the amount of authority they have, the amount of joy they have, has been increasing, increasing, increasing. Because a grudge is not yours to carry. What if you can let go of it and spend your energy carrying the things that are yours to carry? Like your responsibilities and your and your gifts and your callings and your destiny. Okay, there's enormous power. It take it takes power away from evil and moves it to the side of good. Okay, and so you know everybody, everybody has you know pe you have people you're angry at. You have business partners that screw you. You have spouses that screw you. Not only that, all of us have things that, that we have not forgiven ourselves for. We've screwed people. We've cheated on somebody. We've done bad things, okay? And we, need, we have to seek forgiveness. Because, you know, well, do you like carrying guilt around? You know, I, I remember this one guy saying, he goes, he goes, you know, there's people everywhere. They feel guilty, and this guy feels guilty, and that guy feels guilty, and that guy feels guilty. And he goes, you know why people feel guilty? He goes, because they're guilty. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But, but, the, but, 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 but you, you notice that Joseph forgave his brothers because God wanted him to, because God could forgive his brothers. It's like, okay, th this is God's deal, not his. Okay? Your own guilt. It's God's deal, not yours. You just have to give it to him. You just have to be like Solomon, where he goes, wow, well, you know, I'm, I'm trying to walk, and <clears throat> somebody bring me a water in my mouth, it's getting all dried up. Um, wow, you know, I'm walking in these really huge shoes, and I, do, I don't think I'm smart enough to do this. Okay, that's a great start. That's a great starting point for whatever you do and wherever you are. Um, okay, what else was I going to talk about? There was a couple things. Um, oh, okay. Wisdom sometimes asks you to do crazy things. Okay, like I truly, I truly believe that. If you're listening to wisdom and you're asking for it and you're open to it, the answers you get will sometimes grind your gears. Like, you know, like that idea that comes to you in the shower that really, it really does have the, the mark of authenticity on it. Like, wow, I think that's the answer. I just got, where's Shelly? Um, Shelly told me a story two days ago at dinner. Could you? Could you come and tell this story? I just think it's great. Um, you know, I've had moments like this, but not, not quite, maybe not quite this, this dramatic, but Shelly has a story, so. All right, I'll try to make this quick. Um, 1997, 
I'm working for the law, largest law firm in the, in the state of Texas, it's Jackson Walker. And I um, should have never gotten the job. The lady that actually sent me over for the interview told me, she said, don't worry about it, you're not gonna get the job, you don't qualify. Um, but I did get the job. It was a wonderful job, great pay, had my own office, flexible hours, my bosses loved me, I loved my job. But um, I'm sitting in my office one day and I'm thinking, if everything's so great, you know, for my pay, my benefits, why am I so miserable? I mean, and, and I'm, I'm not really praying, you know, but I'm just sort of having this conversation in my head. I, I don't understand why I wake up in the morning and it's so hard for me to get out of bed and actually come to work. And I'm, I'm just sort of contemplating this and I'm sitting in my office, there's nobody else around. And um, I heard a voice, and it wasn't the first time I've heard a voice. I've actually had um, this experience a number of times. But um, I heard a voice, and it said, Shelly, I want you to be a web designer. <laughs> okay? I, I have no idea. I've never done a website. I, I don't know anything about websites. Now, I knew a lot about the Internet, a lot about the Internet. So I was comfortable with the Internet. But I'm like, web design, you know? And, and so it was more of the, the message. The message said, you know, uh, it said, Shelly, I want you to be a web designer. I want you to be ready to have your business up and running on October 7th. And I think that was significant. It was my son's birthday. And there was more. It said, I want you to be ready to leave Jackson Walker January 1st. And I, I, I actually got up out of my chair and I turned around. You know, I, I knew who was talking to me, but I was like, and then I was like, wait a minute, web, web design? You know, okay, God, what are you talking about, web design? And, um, but I actually, I sat down with my husband and I talked about it and I said, okay, I, you know, this, this happened to me today, you know? And, and um, we actually had a plan. Um, I stayed at the, um, the office two nights a week. I worked on their T1s. Um, I had my DBA on October 16th. I left Jackson Walker on January 7th. It was a total, total step in faith. Um, there's a little bit more to this story. A couple of years later, I'm sitting in my, um, actually the kids had gone to bed, my husband's at work, he's a fireman, and um, I actually walked outside, and I had my fist in the air, and I'm like, God, did I make that up? You know? <laughs> did I make that up because, you know, my marriage is not going real good right now, and I'm having trouble paying my bills, and I'm adding it all up, I'm making like pennies on, you know, on an hour, and, um, you know, is there, why did you do this to me? You know, I, I'm really doubting why I did this, and, and literally, literally, it was as if God pulled aside the curtains, and suddenly every single reason, and there was more than one, more than one reason, just like Joseph, there were multiple reasons for why um, God did what he did, and, and a lot like Joseph, there were there were impacts with my family. Um, there were reasons around that. There were um, there were people that I that I actually hired, um, young girls that were interns for me. One of them went on to work with Ross Perot. Um, and then uh, you know, and then there were other things as well. The city of Glenrose that I worked in, I did their first ever Chamber of Commerce website. When 911 came around, that particular city survived. Um, the promise almost went under. The only reason it didn't is because I was actually donating. Um, it was one of my lab experiments, you know? I was just sort of playing around on AdWords and using <coughs> Promise as my lab experiment. But, um, but they were actually struggling and I got mad at the city and I pulled my advertising down and somebody sent out a mass email that was like, the Promise is gonna go under. And I'm like, I guess I better turn that back on again, you know? <laughs> so anyway, I, I just, the whole story about Joseph has really, um, really spoken to me this morning because that, that is my story. That's my story, and that's why I'm here. And I, I really believe that what happened to me um, is because it God allows me to go through that so that I can tell the story. All right. Thank you, Shelly. That was great. So, um, so, so I really, um, I, I have kind of a, a, my, my own sort of story about this sort of thing. Um, and I don't tell it very much because it's kind of personal, um, but uh, um, about, uh, let's see, this would have been the, the spring of 2003, okay? Um, so this one particular day, uh, it was a Friday, it was in March, and um, I had just read Ken McCarthy's, um, or not, Ken McCarthy had said, you should read this book, The Eighty Plane Principle. 
And, uh, and I read it and it like set my mind on fire. It was, uh, well, really, it was kind of one of those J.K. Rowling experiences, like where all of a sudden, like in a flash, I, I can see how, oh, this is a calculus formula, and there's all this stuff you could do with this, and you could build predictive models with it, and, and all this, and, and I was just like spinning around and around. This is a calculus formula. How would you derive it? How would you figure it out? And, and um, and so that, that was going round and round and round in my head. The other thing that was going on in my head was just earlier that week, I had done my first, the first teleseminar I had, I had ever done that was designed to sell. And it was properly scripted, and it was successful, and I had a really good sales day, and I was kind of shocked at what had happened with this. It's like, wow, you know, like my business is really beginning to go somewhere. Um, and, uh, this is before I was like teaching AdWords or anything like that. And I was thinking, wow, how can I use my business to, uh, to help this project in Mozambique? Uh, my wife had been there or was on her way there or something like that. And Mozambique is a very poor country. And we're, we're helping, we're sending some money to this project. And, and I was just saying, how could you do this? So I'm thinking about 80-20 in calculus, and I'm thinking about Mozambique all day long. And um, I, it just so happened, it was a Friday, and it just so happened that my church, they were, they were going to play music, and like the band was going to play, and, and uh, for some reason, I decided to go, and Laura says, yeah, I'll watch the kids, you just go to this thing. And so I, I'm there, and the, and the band is playing music, and I, I am totally in la la And I'm thinking, I'm, I'm a million miles away, and I'm thinking about calculus, and 80-20, and, and uh, Mozambique, and how to raise money for Mozambique. And I look up, and this woman is walking straight towards me. She's, a, she's this black woman. I've never seen her before. And she just marches right up to me. She sticks out her hand. She says, hi, my name is Vivian, and the Lord gave me a word for you. <laughs> this has never happened to me before. I'm like, this should be interesting. And she goes, the Lord told me that you are very, very good at math, and you're working on some kind of formula or some kind of equation or some kind of invention. And you're going to figure it out. You're going to figure it out. Just keep working. You're going to figure it out. And I like look around. You know, there's maybe 30 people in the room. I'm like, how many people in this room are trying to solve a math problem right now? <laughs> <laughs> and I just look at her, and 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 she, and then she turns to walk away, and then she wheels back around. She goes, Oh, and he told me something else. She goes, you went to support missions, and God is going to bless your business so you can support missions. And I look around, and I'm like, how many people in this room are trying to figure out how to support missions right now? It's like one. And I just stare at her, and I go, if only you knew. Like, I'm, on, I'm on the verge of tears. I'm like, um, nothing like this has ever happened to me before. And, and she just, she flashes me the biggest smile you've ever seen in your life. And she goes, he knows. And she walks away. I've seen her one time since. Um, you know, totally, you know, bolt out of the blue experience. Okay? Well... Um, later that year, my business started to take off, and two years later, I went back, I was thinking about, I mean, I have thought about this probably just about every day of my life ever since then, um, and, and I've, uh, a few of you might have heard, like, on a Gladiator video, I talked about um, my wife and I having these fights about, like, how much money we're going to give to different things because she's generous and I'm stingy. <laughs> and, uh, like, she's a giver. 
My wife is a giver, and uh, she loves like that whole Mozambique thing. It's just like so close to her heart, and like we fight about this stuff, and you know, and and she finally she won. Okay, so anyway, um, and uh, but a, a couple years later, I was thinking about this Vivian story, and um, and, and and I have to tell you, it was like. Okay, Perry, there's been all kinds of things where you, you didn't know what was going on or you prayed about something and the, the prayer wasn't answered. There's been all kinds of things like that. However, okay, there, there is no doubt what happened that day. There's, there is no doubt whatsoever, okay? And uh, anyway, so I was going back and I was looking through the emails I got that week. So this was on a Friday. On the Tuesday of that same week, I got an email from Ken McCarthy that said, Perry, I think you should speak on Google AdWords at my seminar. And it was the first time I had ever even contemplated like going into the AdWords business. Okay, now, so here I am in 2010, and you're like, so I got like the best AdWords geniuses here on the stage, and we got this thing in Maui, and we got this huge email list, and all, all this kind of stuff. Okay, there is no question whatsoever in my mind that, that my place in the world and the things that I do were a responsibility that was given to me as a gift to be stewarded. And, and, it, it, and it was given basically because I decided to listen to my wife and take care of the poorest of the poor. Okay? And so it's just it's just like when God comes to Solomon in a dream and he says, What do you want? Okay. Well, is 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 that gift, is that offering about Solomon? Or is it about the people that he governs? and the people around him. And he decided, this is not about me, this is about the people around me. Okay? And I view it the same way. Like, okay, woe is me if I exploit my position to just take from people without giving. You know, there, there's, a, there's a verse in the Old Testament that talks about, um, it says, don't uh, I don't know the wording, but it's something like, don't get every last bit of grain out of your fields when you harvest. Leave a little bit so the poor people can come and glean and have something to eat. Okay? Um, you know, if somebody has no money, okay, well, Google's not going to give them any, any, any AdWords clicks, that's for sure. You know, but if somebody has no money, if they search my website hard enough, they could probably find everything they really need, you know? You know, and of course, you know, and we, we sell the good stuff to the people who pay, but, you know, there's kind of a, okay, let's try to give to the world. Let's try to, you know, and I think that that could be overdone, and I try not to overdo that, but, you know, I, I really believe that, that the, actually Dan Kennedy said this, and, uh, and, and it, it, it's a perfect Danism. He goes, he goes. Uh, you know, the engineer would never really understand this, but giving has its way of coming back to you. He goes, he goes. You, you receive out of the same orifice you give out of. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I, I think if you take a posture of generosity towards the world, I think if you take a posture of I'm gonna. I'm going to under promise and over deliver. I'm gonna give a bigger tip. I'm gonna. I, I'm. I'm gonna give more, not less. That there, there is a spiral that will happen in your life. It goes upwards, not downwards. So um, I am already over time, and I'm. I'm, I'm gonna be done. Um, I'll just. I'll just put one last thing out to you, which is um, during lunch, uh, Donovan's doing an SEO presentation. And I think you'll find it really fascinating. Um, those of you who want to have uh, a crazy, you know, spiritual conversation, I'll like sit out on one of the tables out there, and it's like no agenda, no, 
Um, you know, no particular, like just whatever you guys want to talk about, I'll be out there, we can talk about it. Meanwhile, the rest of you, I hope you'll download Donovan's thing. Um, if you if you miss Donovan's thing, we'll make you a CD or something, and, and so, you know, so you don't miss it. But anyway, um, I, I am really thankful that you're all here. I consider the fact that you are here to be an investment of time and money and trust, and, and I just, I want to bless all of you. I hope that, I hope that because you're here, that your businesses just go crazy. I hope you guys make so much money and make so many people happy that, like, everybody's like, wow, what happened to you? And you're like, well, I don't know, but it sure was good.